All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Judah. I'm a third year grad student at UCLA. And today I'd like to share with you some of the early results and developing techniques coming out of the Distant Giants survey. So Distant Giants is a radial velocity follow-up survey to a sample of test systems with detected small inner transiting planets. And we'll be searching through this survey for large outer companions to these inner planets. So Distant Giants is being conducted as part of the larger Tess Keck survey, or TKS. And if you'd like more details on that, uh, it will be the subject of Ashley Chantos's talk uh, later today. Right. So for Distant Giants in particular, broadly speaking, Distant Giants is a search for exosystems that resemble our own solar system. Uh, but it's not exactly immediately clear what it means for a system to resemble our own. So basically the question is what are the key characteristics? And so to answer that, we kind of have to back up and note that conventionally questions of exoplanet habitability have centered around the concept of the habitable zone. Basically asking the question, can a planet support surface liquid water? But in recent years, it's become evident that a more holistic view of an exosystem is necessary uh, to characterize whether its constituent systems are indeed habitable. So it's become more common to look at the broader characteristics of a system. And one of these key characteristics, especially for distant giants, is called the system's architecture. So the architecture of a system describes the overall dynamical and orbital characteristics of all of the bodies in that system. So these would be things like masses, periods, period ratios, eccentricities, obliquities, and so on. In the case of the solar system, one of the most prominent dynamical or architectural characteristics is this strict dichotomy between the inner terrestrial planets and the outer giants. And this prompts us to ask, is this feature unique to the solar system or do we see it in the broader sample of exosystems? Okay, so more specifically, we are asking what is the relationship between distant giants and close-in small planets? So we know from transit surveys like Kepler and K2 that small close-in planets are essentially ubiquitous. You find them at a rate of about one per star. And by contrast, distant giants are comparatively rare, occurring around only about 10% of stars. And what complicates this picture is that the stellar samples from which detections of these two planet classes are drawn are essentially disjoint, which means that very few stars have been probed for both a close-in subjovian and a distant giant. And so the question still remains, are these two populations of planets fundamentally related to each other? So the distant giant survey seeks to answer this question by constraining the and that's a little bit blocked off, but that is the conditional probability of finding a distant giant in a system that's already known to host a close in transiting planet. So the ideal place to start a survey that uh, depends on all of its targets having a close in transiting or a close in small planet is with results from a transit survey. So we started with a sample of 47 sun-like test targets that all are known to have small transiting planets. We've been observing them for about a year and a half now, and we'll continue observations uh, for a further year and a half for a total baseline of about three years. Thus far, we've detected evidence for 10 distant giants, or rather distant giants in 10 of these systems. And at the end of the survey, the uh, final estimate of this conditional probability, which again, is a little bit blocked, but the probability of finding a distant giant in a close in transiting system will just be the number of systems showing evidence for a distant giant divided by the total survey sample. And although this in itself is kind of a straightforward statistic, we found that all of the systems that we're studying have their own, um, basically have a, a lot of information to give us as individual systems outside of the context of the survey. And probably in no system is this more true than HD 1919-39. So this is one of the first uh, of the systems in distant giants that showed evidence for a distant companion. 
Uh, it's a very interesting multi-transiting system. It has three transiting sub-Neptunes and a fully resolved distant giant at about a 100-day orbital period. And then finally, it has evidence for an outer, even larger uh, planet that's showing up in the RV residuals. So if you'd like the full dynamical breakdown and characterization of this system, you can attend Jack Lubin's poster talk, uh, which is in both poster sessions today. But for now, I'll focus on it in the context of just distant giants. So when we subtract out the radial velocity signatures of these four planets, the inner transiting planets, as well as the fully resolved outer giant, what we see is not a flat RV curve, which is, or rather a flat and level zero RV curve, as we'd expect if we had characterized the system completely. Instead, there's this gradual increase over the duration of the observational baseline. And this suggests that there's some kind of outer companion that's continuing to accelerate the star beyond what we've already accounted for. <clears throat> and so this is how we detect distant giants or at least how we see evidence of distant giants when the survey baseline, in this case, uh, three years or just the one and a half years that we've been observing is much shorter than the orbital period. So you can imagine that what we're looking at here is a very zoomed in uh, frame or shot of a larger Keplerian orbit. So HD 191939 teaches us an important lesson early on, which is that in a survey that's only about three years long, if we want to attain sensitivity to true Jupiter analogs with orbits of 10 or 20 or 30 years, then we need to, again, get sensitivity to partial orbits, not just fully resolved Keplerians. And so the way that we do this is by leveraging not only all of the information that RVs have to give us in the form of residual trends in the RV time series, but also by integrating a complementary set of data in the form of astrometry. So again, RVs provide us with these two terms, the gamma dot is the parameterization of that linear trend in the residuals and gamma double dot describes any curvature if the RV time series actually starts to turn over. On the astrometry side, the Hipparchos Gaia Catalog of Accelerations was published by Tim Brandt in 2018. And the concept here is that this catalog aligned the reference frames of the Hipparchos mission in the early 90s and the Gaia mission in the mid 2010s. So what we can do here is take a star and compare its proper motion in the Hipparchos epoch, which I've indicated here, the average is that red arrow. So it's proper motion vector in the Hipparchos epoch to the proper motion vector in the Gaia epoch. And if these two are significantly different, namely if this change in proper motion delta mu is significantly different from zero, then we treat this as evidence for some kind of distant giant perturber. So now we have an imprint that a distant giant puts on the radial velocity time series in the form of these two simple parameters and also in the astrometry. So our question is, can we combine these two to get a full characterization of this companion? So here I have 191939 as a case study for this larger um, characterization technique. So 191939 has statistically significant trend and curvature as we've seen already in the RV residuals. It also has a significant change in proper motion between the Hipparchos and Gaia epochs. And so if we look to the right, this is an array of masses and semi-major axes which represent potential model parameters where we've um, marginalized out the rest of the orbital parameters. So we're basically asking, what are the potential mass and semi-major axis pairs that could describe this outer companion? And what we do is we take any given mass and semi-major axis and forward model the RV curve and see what its trend and curvature terms would be. If those match up very well with our measured data, then this is considered a high RV likelihood model and it's colored in in a darker shade of green corresponding to how well it agrees. And likewise for the astrometry, darker shades of blue represent higher likelihood astrometric models. Now the confluence of these two posterior distributions represents the subset of models with the greatest overall probability to represent our uh, distant companion in this system. And in this case, and that's indicated in red. And so in this case, we get out some 
somewhat broad um, parameter intervals at the 95% confidence level. And this allows us not necessarily to zone in on exactly what the mass and semi-major axis are, but just to put uh, bounds on them for the sake of concluding that there is a distant giant out there and we can get a rough sense qualitatively of what kind of object it is. So before I wrap up, I imagine I'm kind of short on time, but just to um, bring us back around, the Distant Giant Survey is an ongoing follow-up to transit hosting test targets. We've already detected evidence of 10 distant giants uh, in the systems through a three sigma trend, and we'll potentially see more uh, throughout the rest of the survey until it ends in around 2023. Uh, expected results coming out of this survey are a um, continually developing RV slash astrometry joint analysis package, which I was just describing. And then finally, the uh, nominal or fundamental result of the survey is this constraint on the probability of finding a distant giant in a system with a close in small planet. And again, although kind of a um, simple calculation at the end of the survey, this is a value that's going to give us insights into the history of not only our own solar system, but also into the formation processes and dynamics of the broader population of, uh, of exosystems. So with that, I will take any questions and uh, thank you for listening. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, this is an interesting question. Okay, so the question was, the astrometry technique leverages both Hipparchos and Gaia data. Would we be able to apply the same technique in the future using just Gaia data? And um, I think in short, yes. I mean, the principle would be the same, but one of the um, real advantages, let's see. One of the real advantages that's stressed between the um, by leveraging Hipparchos is this really long baseline. So I actually simplified the picture a little bit here um, in saying that the delta proper motion is just the difference between the average Gaia and average Hipparchos proper motions. Actually, the Hipparchos proper motion has pretty large error bars. And so what you're able to do um, in addition to using the Gaia proper motion is take the position in the Gaia epoch and the position in the Hipparchos epoch and which I've indicated with these blue arrows. And if you subtract those and divide by the 24 year baseline, you get the average proper motion between the two. So delta mu is technically the, uh, the difference between this red arrow and the difference in these two blue arrows divided by that 24 years, uh, which means that the 24 year baseline is, is very useful. Uh, because it lowers those error, error bars for the second proper motion. Uh, but again, in principle, yes, it would be, I think, the same. Oh. No, this is a good question. So why have I uh, shown the, the stellar path as just being uh, purely circular? And you're exactly right. It does not need to be circular. This is a simplified uh, stellar orbit. and you know, quite zoomed in. So the outer companion would be somewhere much farther away, depending on its mass. And um, in the general case, does not need to be circular at all. Right, so I actually uh, was just talking. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, so is it possible that uh, direct imaging could play a role in helping to constrain uh, some of these outer companions? So the majority of the work that uh, we've put in so far for this method has been 1919-39 in particular. And I was actually just speaking with um, Jerry. I'm not sure if he's here right now. Oh, Jerry. Oh, great. And so he actually gave me some insights uh, on direct imaging. And it looks like it's not possible for this companion in particular, given the separation. But I think in principle, that could provide uh, another complementary constraint for us.
Oh yeah. Oh, sorry, Kyle. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. All right. Um, hi. Uh, great talk. Um, uh, I was wondering if you've looked at um, improving the uh, sort of constraint from the astrometry uh, by incorporating EDR3 proper motions. Yeah, great question. So actually, uh, yes, the, the newest constraints that we just uh, put on this companion do incorporate uh, EDR3. And in fact, prior to the incorporation of EDR3 using just uh, Gaia DR2, there was no significant detection of proper motion. Uh, in the in 1939, and that significantly um, increased the number of possible models for astrometry in this low mass regime. And so I've cut them off now, but yeah, it did help quite a bit to incorporate EDR3. Right, so the, the question was, um, there are three inner transiting planets as well, these transiting sub-Neptunes I mentioned. So were there any dynamical arguments used uh, to, to constrain the parameters of the outer, of the outer companion or, or the outer two companions? Uh, and uh, the answer to that broadly is yes. And I think that Jack will actually have a more insightful answer uh, when he gives his poster talk on the full dynamical picture. Because uh, yeah, my... My understanding is that there was a lot of consideration given to dynamical interactions between the planets in the system. Uh, 